So thank you very much, uh, Pierrick and Hugo, for, for the invitation. It's a, it's a great honor for me to be part of the advisory board of this great company. Really, it's a pleasure to join the team. Thank you very much. And also to have some eminent fellows uh, in, in, this, uh, in this advisory board, such as uh, Russell and Emmanuel. It's a pleasure to be part of it. So um, Russell told you about why we sleep. And I guess the, the second question would be, how do we sleep? And this is not an easy question to address because most of the studies have included patients, people who were complaining of sleep, uh, sleepiness, maybe or of insomnia. So it doesn't give you a picture of the normal sleep in a general population. There has been some, some attempts, uh, such as the, the Wisconsin Sleep Cohort Study that was performed in the late 80s, early 90s, where they took employees, state employees, and they analyzed their sleep. So it's not completely population-based, but it was already interesting. In Lausanne, uh, in Switzerland, we, we have tried to, to have really a, a kind of picture of the normal sleep in a randomly selected population. This is a study called Hypnolos, Hypnolos, Hypno for sleep and Los for Lausanne. So in this population, it was, uh, they were randomly selected from uh, an, another bigger cohort called Colos, uh, which was uh, designed to study cardiovascular risk and genetics. So the, 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 the large study, uh, Colos, uh, included more than 5,000 people, and they all had uh, a clinical workup for all the disease, cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, and they also filled various questionnaires about the sleep habits, about the sleep complaints, such as the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, Epworth Sleepiness Scale, which is uh, seven, uh, eight questions, and uh, they ask you, uh, what is your Tend, wh what is your tendency to fall asleep in these uh, situations? Then other questionnaires about narcolepsy, sleep apnea, and parasomnia. What is interesting here is that 4,000 of these people also had a psychiatric evaluation, a head-to-head -head psychiatric evaluation, which is really valuable for, for our assessment also. And more than 2,000 of these people agreed to have a full polysomnography, a full sleep study in their home environment. I think this is very important. They were not in lab, but in their usual sleeping environment. So these people were aged between 40 and 85 years old, and they came in late afternoon in our lab, and they had all the different parameters uh, necessary to measure sleep, like electroencephalogram to measure the brain activity, electrooculogram, electromyogram, the breathing parameters, and also leg movements to have all the disease also that can occur during sleep. Then they would return home, Sometimes, um, oops, uh, there is some, something is missing. Okay, Th there was, uh, they would return home, sleep in their home environment, and, and then we would analyze the, the, the results. Um, it's a problem because there are several slides missing here. Yeah, okay, uh, we'll go on. Um, so, uh, Overall, overall, uh, the, these people slept for 6.7 hours per night, which was not, not bad. Um, they had a sleep efficiency of 85%. Sleep efficiency is the, the time you actually spend asleep uh, during the night. And they had a BMI, uh, if I remember well, of, uh, of um, 26, so they were mildly overweight. Um, this, is, uh, this is actually a problem because everything is okay. Uh, now, now it's okay. It's uh, no, it's not. Okay. Um, okay. Um, let's say okay. This is the different sleep stages that these people reached during during the night. So you see REM sleep. This is paradoxical sleep. Stage one, which is light sleep. Stage two, which is uh, intermediate sleep, and slow wave sleep. So what is interesting here is that they had a fair amount of slow wave sleep which means that they had a fairly good sleep, and also of REM sleep, which is dream sleep uh, mainly. Uh, we were interested in the time, it was um, that the, the time they took to fall asleep between the time they turn off the light and they actually reach sleep. And we divided the population into different categories. You see 40 to 50, 50 to 60, 60, 70, and more than 70. And you see that they take it takes more and more time to fall asleep when you 
uh, advance with age. Um, sleep efficiency, so again, this is a percentage of time that you actually sleep between the time you, you turn off the light and you turn on the light. And here, as expected, uh, we see a decrease, meaning that uh, the, the, the efficiency, the sleep quality tends to decrease with age, which we knew already. This is the percentage of slow wave sleep, so deep sleep. And you can see there is a kind of step here in the middle between 50, 60 and 60, 70. So it means that older people have less slow wave sleep. There could be different reasons for, for that. If we take uh, other population, the global population between five and 100 years old, you see that total sleep time decreases. Obviously, adolescents, uh, young children, we sleep more than adults, we, we, we sleep more than older people, but older people have really uh, a lower total sleep time than younger people. Again, sleep efficiency between five and 95 years old, you see that there is a gradual decrease in sleep quality and sleep <coughs> efficiency uh, during the night. So what was surprising for us is ob objectively they have a very bad sleep, but subjectively we asked them through a, a score, a post score, so do you complain of sleepiness? Do, do, do you tend to fall asleep when you don't want to? And you can see here the percentage of people complaining of sleepiness. These are, again, the age categories. And this was quite a surprise for us. So older people didn't complain more, but less than the others, which was completely the opposite of wha what we believed. And uh, you see here, especially in women, the trend is totally clear. The older you get, the less you complain of falling asleep during daytime, which is completely the opposite of what uh, many people think. So why is that? We have different hypotheses. Maybe older people are retired, they have lower expectancies regarding their vigilance. Um, maybe they can have short naps during daytime because they don't work, so it's not very clear, but it means that when, we, that's what we tell the doctors, when an old people, when older people complain of sleepiness, it's not normal, it's not just uh, the, the age. It's, uh, you, you need to, 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 to look for, for the cause of, of this sleepiness. And I think this is an important message. This is also very interesting. We asked in the morning, do, uh, how did you sleep? And they could choose between very bad, bad, good, or very good. And this is the percentage of people who said good or very good. And you see again, the age categories intends to increase and not decrease, which is exactly the opposite of what we observe objectively during the night. So their sleep is catastrophic, but they complain less than the others, which is really, really interesting. Now, we just talked about the, the sleep structure, sleep efficiency, sleep quality, but we're also interested in sleep disorders. How common, how frequent are the, the sleep disorders in this general population sample? So it's very important to have a general population sample to address this question, because if you take people who come to the lab, they obviously have a higher prevalence of sleep disorders. So we can start with insomnia. So insomnia is probably the most prevalent sleep disorder. It can be uh, defined as either difficulty to fall asleep, repeated awakenings during the night, or an early awakening before the alarm clock, associated with complaints during the daytime, fatigue, lack of concentration, irritability. So this occurs in about one third of the adult population. It increases with age, it's more frequent in women compared uh, to men, and many, many of these people take hypnotics, medication to, to fall asleep which we know is not very good for the long term. Very interestingly, 70% of them didn't talk about it with their doctors. So that means that people try to find solution by themselves, which is maybe not a bad idea because they would get a sleeping pill from their doctor. In hypnolos, in our cohort, we also try to address this question of how frequent is insomnia. So if we take just one of the criteria, more than 30 minutes to fall asleep, three to four times per week, uh, it's about 11% of the population. It's more frequent in females than males. If you take two of the criteria for insomnia, so either 30 minutes to fall asleep or nocturnal awakenings three to four times per week, it's uh, almost one third of this adult population, which is exactly what was reported before. So it's very, very frequent. Usually, most people get a sleeping pill when they go to the doctors, but the most efficient therapy is cognitive behavioral therapy, which does not involve medication. When you look at the studies, long-term studies, this type of approach yields better results than, than the, the sleeping pills. 
and it's cheaper also. And it's just based on psychoeducation, stimulus control, to avoid everything that can disturb your sleep, restriction of time in bed. This is very important. You try to concentrate your, 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 your sleep in a shorter period in order, in order to not to dilute it over a too long period. And many older people will, oh, I didn't sleep well last night, so what, what am I going to do? I'm going to go to bed earlier and try to have a nap during the day and maybe get out of bed later. And things get worse. Why? Because they dilute their sleep over a longer period. So when they first come, we, uh, we tell them, okay, you are not allowed to go to bed before midnight and you have to get out of bed at six. And if they do it, they sleep much better very quickly. If they don't, they, they stay like that. But and after a while, they can extend a little bit. But they need first a shock to, to, to reorganize their, their sleep. And this is very, very efficient. Relaxation, cognitive treatment. Many people overestimate the consequences of their insomnia. And they, they think that every, anything that bad that happens during the day is due to their insomnia. And so we try to, to disconnect the, these, two, these two parameters. Hope the video will work. <laughs> Can you try to turn it on? Yeah, it should. With the sound, please. Nice. Okay. So this is another story. So you see a, a middle-aged man, a little bit overweight, with a broad neck that has a, a, a sleep study. He snores. And suddenly stops snoring. You can see that he's trying to breathe, but we don't hear anything anymore. And usually when you breathe, chest and abdomen move together. And here it's the opposite, the chest goes inside. You know why? It's because he's trying to suck the air in by making a negative pressure inside the chest, but the airway is completely blocked. There is an obstruction. <laughs> He needs to wake up in order to, to, to activate his uh, pharyngeal muscles, to open the airway and resume his breathing. But as soon as he goes back to sleep, the muscles of the, of the throat relax again and there is again a collapse of the upper airway. The more he tries to breathe, the more there is a suction effect here at, at the throat level. So again, he tries to breathe, but it's completely blocked here. So air cannot come to the lungs. This is what we call sleep apnea. And the problem is that each time he wants to resume his breathing, he has to wake up. It's a very short awakening. He's not aware of it. If you ask him, he says, oh, I slept for the whole night, but I'm tired in the morning. And because he doesn't remember these short awakenings, because it's too short, but it's necessary to save him from dislocating. OK, so this will probably happen many, many times during the night. We consider that Less than five or 10 is probably normal, but more than 15 or more than 30 is probably a serious condition. And the problem is that when we studied our population, we assessed the, the, the prevalence of sleep apnea. And if you take different threshold, five of these events per hour, 15 of these events per hour, or 30 of these breathing events, apnea per hour. And you see that if you take moderate to severe sleep apnea, it's about half of this middle to older age population. and about a fourth for the women. So this is a very, very common disease that we can find in the general population. If we took adolescents, it would be much lower, but in people between 40 and above obviously have a lot of this sleep apnea. And you know that sleep apnea is associated with disturbed sleep because they need to wake up all the time to resume their breathing. So they, they won't be able to reach deep sleep. They will be tired during the day and they have about seven times increased risk of a car accident. Uh, they become less performant at work, and they are more likely to have cardiovascular disease because it's a huge stress to suffocate so many times during the night. It increases blood pressure, and you have about a twofold increase of risk of having a stroke also. So a very serious condition. If you take people who have uh, uh, sleep apnea and sleepiness, it's uh, obviously lower, but if you consider 10% of this middle to old age population, it's millions of people around the world who will suffer from this condition. Another condition, maybe you can start the video, please. This is something a bit special. Um, you see here, this is leg electromyogram. So this is the movement of the legs. You see the video here. So suddenly the person is sleeping. 
but he removed the legs. So this is non-voluntary movement. He cannot control them. And it occurs very regularly during the night. So it may seem very benign, but if you look here, this is, these are the activation of the muscles, and this is the brain EEG. So, so th there, there is an activation of the brain each time they move the legs. So it's very controversial whether it's a disease or not, but it may induce some sleepiness. It may disrupt the sleep, and further research is needed to, to really know what, what is the impact of this. But it's interesting to, to study this type uh, of, of condition. So how frequent is it? It's about... <coughs> 7% of the population according to this study, but in our <coughs> people between 40 and 80 years old, it was almost 28 people, 28% of the people who have this condition. So we really need to determine who will suffer from this condition and who needs to be treated or not, but we really need to, to address this question. So overall, sleep disorders are very frequent in the general population, but we need clearly more epidemiological data uh, to, to, to better understand the prevalence of sleep disorders and what is normal and what is abnormal in sleep. Um, and I think that we could achieve this much better if we had other means of studying sleep. Right now, we need to put all the electrodes on them. They have to sleep either in a sleep lab or at home, and we study them for one night. So hopefully in the future, with the collaboration of DREAM, we could have a larger sample of voluntary people who want to participate and who could be studied for several nights, several months, and give us better insight of what is sleep and what is abnormal in sleep. So I would like to thank the whole team uh, of Lausanne, especially my colleague and friend, uh, Jose Abarubio, who is doing a tremendous job with, with our cohort and all the technicians and doctors of the sleep lab. And thank you for your attention.